I was a boy, I quite enjoyed school, you know, maths, Latin, English, but there was one subject that made me anxious, religion. I was told that someone in the Old Testament drove his chariot furiously and that another danced delicately. And I wanted to say, and your point is? And there was this chap called Jesus who suggested we should all be kind to each other and not obsessed by power and money, and he got crucified for that. Seemed a bit unfair. I became frightened that something that was so clearly important from the way that people behaved about it was completely incomprehensible. So I decided it was all rubbish, so I became an atheist for about... 25 years, and then I read a book by Aldous Huxley that said there were two approaches to religion. One was to do with people hoping to have some experience of the divine, and the other was the religion of words and symbols, which seemed to me to boil down to crowd control. But that first bit got me interested. Now, my first guest here is uh, Helen. Helen, I want you to... Uh, Look at that camera and tell me your name. <laughs> the name's Bond. Helen Bond. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I love it. Now, you are Professor of Christian Origins at the University of Edinburgh. Yes, that's right. And I've asked Helen on because actually we know each other. We have. We've met We've before. We've met before and you <laughs> would not believe this. When the Monty Pythons were doing the show at the O2 in 2014, we did 15 performances to 16,000 people. At the very same time, there was a conference going on, right, at where, what, University it, of London? It was King's College London, and it, it was put together by our good friend, Joan Taylor. Who can't be with us because yes. she's in New Zealand. And Joan organised... <laughs> I've been quite serious, a conference about the effects that the film Life of Brian had had on biblical studies, right? And it was one of the most popular conferences ever. People were just queuing up both to be on the, on, on the lineup and also to, to come along to the and conference. And there's a real book of the proceedings of this <laughs> conference. So what, what, I can't remember, what did they say that the film had done to help Christian scholarship? <laughs> well, I suppose the thing is it's, it's a useful thing to think with. So we thought about what are the things that the Pythons got right? And there's ah. lots of things that the Pythons got right, um, you know, particularly to do with the political and social world of the first century, situating Jesus within this Jewish landscape. Um, and also some of the things perhaps that the Pythons got wrong or that, that just help us to think a little bit about how we're putting together the life of Jesus. It was really interesting to think that we given actually given proper academics a new perspective. So I thought it would be fun if I asked Helen some questions about Christianity, which are kind of very, very simple, but I think that they're things that people don't know. I mean, for a start, what evidence is there for Christ's existence other than what's in the Bible? There's actually really good evidence that he existed. Um, it's not from absolutely the same time, but from about sort of 60 years later, there's a Jewish historian called jo uh, Josephus, and he writes about Jesus. The passage has been uh, edited by Christians, so we have to be a little bit careful about it, but we're pretty sure that he did write something about Jesus. And he was a Jewish historian? Jewish historian. He's got no particular acts to grind about Christianity. He just lists it in, in amongst a sort of a series of tumults and problems that happened when Pontius Pilate was governor. And then within a century of the life of Jesus, we have Roman writers mentioning him. So we have Tacitus, we have uh, Pliny mentioning what Christians. What sort of thing are they saying? Well, Tacitus, um, he, he says that Jesus was, was executed. He, he suffered the supreme punishment, crucifixion, under Pontius Pilate. And he's actually interested in, in Christians in, uh, in Rome under Nero. So that's what he's telling us about. But just as a sort of sideline, an intro, he just mentions so Jesus. So there's all this uh, evidence that's not from inside the Bible. Yeah, and, and the thing is, people will say, oh, well, that's decades later. But, 
given the fact that Jesus was an artisan, he's the kind of person who would not normally show up in any kind yeah. of records. And, and, you know, again, we've lost lots and lots of, in, of information, lots of written texts from the ancient world, and we know more about Jesus than we actually do about many other significant people from the classical world. More than we know about John, mm -hmm. what is this all about? Uh, it's about Christianity. Hey, they. All right, let's talk now about the Bible, which is obviously our main source. What were the, fir the first time anybody wrote about Jesus was Mark? No, actually, oh. what, what people don't always realize is that the earliest Christian texts are from Paul. So probably in the late 40s or so, Paul the Apostle, the one who goes um, sailing about the Mediterranean and founding Christian churches, he's the first one to, to write, and he writes letters to oh, all these places that he's visited. He I see what so they're from mean. the 40s, 50s, that Christ kind of Because Christ is crucified day. around 33, or is it later? Around we about, around early about. 30s, yeah. So within a know. very few years, Paul is writing about it. Yeah, him. so Paul, Paul becomes a Christian within, you know, very soon after that, and, and then he starts on his journeys and certainly within 15 years or so he starts to write letters and Paul knows people who knew Jesus um, the and disciples. And he's writing letters so, to Christian communities yeah. which have already formed. Yes um, some of them he formed himself yeah. and so he's kind of keeping in touch oh, with I them by, by letter afterwards. Now tell us what the Bible tells us about Jesus. His ministry starts Three years before his death? It's very hard to know. Yeah, I mean, course, three, yeah. three years is taken from John's Gospel, which suggests that there's at least... Well, there's, 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 two, there's three Passovers there, so that yeah. you've got at least sort of two and a half years. Mark's Gospel and Matthew and Luke give us no sense of chronology. I mean, maybe maybe three years. I mean, maybe longer. We, we really so don't we know. So we start in Galilee, mm -hmm. and we start with, I shall make you fishers of men. <laughs> yes, right? or people, we would say nowadays. Oh, sorry, yes, sorry. <laughs> I forget about this stuff. I'm very old. I know the King James <laughs> version. Yes, fishes of people. And then we hear about some of his sermons and some of his uh, miracles, healing people, mm -hmm. which I find quite possible because mm -hmm. I thought so there are healers who can do extraordinary things. I think there's no doubt about that at all. Well, I think it's interesting that, that in the ancient world, the opponents don't say, no, he couldn't do those things. I mean, some of the, the rabbinic sources call him a, a sorcerer, but oh, really? what they're disputing is where the power comes from. You know, is he channeling, channeling the power of God or is yeah. he working with, with evil spirits? But I think historically, Jesus's miracles were probably the most significant thing about him. It's the miracles that draw the crowds. And, you know, in the ancient world, there's, there's, there's very few doctors or people Absolutely. with any medical knowledge. Everyone must have had something that they wanted healing. Um, so all these people are coming to him. And, and in a way, once he's got that captive audience, then he starts to tell them about the kingdom of God, this, this uh, sort of place, this, this um, new realm where God is going to be in charge. And um, that's when he's got his, his audience. After the crucifixion, can you sum up what the Bible says about what happens then in terms of the resurrection? Well, yeah, so on, uh, on the Sunday morning, uh, the third day, um, women come back to the, the tomb and um, they find it empty. Um, don't know quite what to do about it. In Mark's Gospel, they just run off. That's it. They're, uh -huh. they're terrified. And in the other Gospels, they also include appearances of the risen Jesus. Yeah. And so that then, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, persuades Jesus' followers that he's not dead, but he has... And in, in, in the language of the Gospels, he has been risen. He has been raised, so he's been raised by God. This isn't something he does, but God raises him up. There's always this gap between the fact that religions are always founded by mystics, and I think Christ was a mystic, mm, mm. you know? Most of us don't go into the desert for 40 years. Mm -hmm. You know, I think 40 he, days, not 40, 40 days. days. <laughs> <laughs> I yes, don't think we'd survive 40 years. That would have upset <laughs> biblical studies. <laughs> 40 days. Um, I, he was a mystic, and yet, Religions mm. seem to finish up 
being administered by people who are definitely not mystics, who seem to be a bit more like bureaucrats who are determined to preserve the power of the organisation. They're started by mystics or charismatics, people, people who buy the strength of their own personality, their, their sense of the spirit, yeah. um, can, can gather crowds around them. I think, I mean, what, what, my reading of, of, of certainly certain periods of Christianity is that this sort of move towards bureaucracy often happened with the best of intentions. Uh -huh. So, you know, in those early years, um, Christians thought that the end of the world was coming. When, it, when they realised that it wasn't coming quite so soon as they'd thought, they start to realise that, you know, we've got to, we've got to plan. We've got to plan to be in the world. We've yeah. got to sort of batten down the head hatches. We've got to look, um, you know, respectable. And, and, and that's the point, actually, where, where women start to be um, sort of pushed down and smothered by oh, Christianity. Oh, that's extraordinary. Um, you know, I mean, in, in, in Jesus' time, women are, are disciples. There's very good evidence for women yes. disciples. And even Paul, who gets a bad press on this, he talks about women as deacons. He sends letters with women. Um, he talks about women as apostles. He's very open to women's so ministry. So does this, does this all change with Constantine? But I think a lot of the damage had been done by then. You know, the, the, the sort of hierarchy had already developed I mean it became much more um, sort of articulated and and, and clear-cut by that time women had already been sort of pushed down and and depressed and um, and I think throughout the sort of the history of the church there's always there's always some threat you know whether that's um, the rise of science or rationalism and, and 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 often I think the way that the church reacts probably wrongly, is yes. to sort of batten down the hatches. You yes, know, we believe that it fundamentalism... A, yeah, it works as a sort of a power organisation. Mm. Helen, it's just been an absolute delight. You've told me stuff I've been thinking about. I won't say all my life. I say since I started reading stuff uh, preparatory to writing Life of Brian. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you. I'm Andrew Doyle, executive producer of The Dinosaur Hour, and Lewis Schaefer with me here. You were the maitre d' in The Dinosaur no, Hour. No, I was the star of the entire show, and I think people are going to see that when they... Uh, you were, they're going to see we it. cut you out a lot. You, you know, know what? If my mother was still living, she would, like, be furious. She would, but she's she not, would. and I knew that that was OK. No, but I am in, I am in the uh, opening... S I hope you don't cut out the opening section. No, you're in the opening section. I'm in the opening but, section. And, of course, working with John Cleese, that must be uh, exciting. Well, that was... That was amazing, really. I didn't appreciate it at the time, but then I'm, I'm sitting there working with him. I'm thinking, this is John Cleese. Yeah. This is John Cleese, as in cheese. He's and you got, got to get that yeah. right. He, he hate in America yeah. they call him Cleese. Yeah. And he really has a problem with that. But you're an American and you're getting it right. Well, my name is Schaefer. People say Schaffer. You just got to get used to it. <laughs> or change your name to something that everybody pronounces. Yeah. Properly. People normally get mine right. Although I was called Andrew Boyle yeah. by a critic once. Made me angry. Oh, uh, because that's the, probably the first time that's ever happened to you. With yeah. me, my name has been misspelled. I remember one time I noticed my name was spelled correctly at a restaurant, and I was like, it was maybe it was in my 30s, and I was like shocked <laughs> because it never happens. But John, please. John, please. Yeah. I mean, it, it, the great thing about the show was to be able to make the show that he wanted to make, which was talking to the people that he found interesting uh, about the subjects that he found interesting. And that yeah. isn't something that normally uh, is granted by television channels to stars. They normally tell them what they have to do, no. where they have to stand, yeah. all of that. Well, let's just let's just hope that people he finds interesting or people we find interesting. Or that the audience finds interesting. Yeah, that's what I mean, yeah. Well, I found them interesting. No, I found them interesting. Yeah. I have to find them interesting because I'm working with John Cleese. Yes. What did you think? It was interesting hearing John Cleese talk to Helen Bond. Yeah. About Christianity and about, about the origins of it and yeah. about the life of Jesus. What I didn't realise was that there's a lot of evidence that Jesus did actually exist as a historical figure. So yes. it's not just all about the stories yeah. and about the parables and about the, you know, and about the, what, what the meaning of the, the Gospels. It's about him as a, a, a human being in history. Yeah, but how important is that? The most important thing is what people believe in right now. I know all about that. I studied that when I was at uni. Did you? Well, even before uni, I studied that. 
with uh, with people, and I knew about Josephus, and I knew about the, Josephus, Jewish historian. Though. Yes, so I knew I knew all about this then, yeah. and I knew that there was evidence of a real Jesus, but also there were probably many people like Jesus yeah. who didn't quite hit the heights that Jesus hit, didn't have the people to follow him. It's, it's good for John Cleese to be doing a show about religion because he got in so much trouble doing Life of Brian, right? Yeah. So much trouble. Do you remember there was that interview where he's talking to a, yeah. a, a, a clergyman? Yeah. And, and he's obviously upset with him about, about making the film, you know? It offended a lot of people, it was banned. Christians hated it. They did it, not that many, the fact no, is. No, but the ones that did hate it really hated the it. The fact is, he was like the last one to actually offend anybody. Nobody's offended by Christianity right now, and <laughs> I've become almost like a supporter of Christianity. The Dinosaur Hour on GB News. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Now, there's a, a very good reason why I want to talk to my next guest, who is a professor of philosophy of religion at Cambridge, right? Associate professor, but thanks for promoting no, me. No, you're a professor. I'm not prepared <laughs> to argue about this. James Orr, everything that I looked at when I got interested in religion was an effort for me because I had to uproot all the assumptions that I got from being in a Christian culture for umpteen years. Can you talk a little mm -hmm. bit about that? Well, John, what happened to you happened to the West about 500 years ago. Um, you know, once upon a time, the, the religion didn't really mean anything as something that was just a distinct tradition. You know, once upon a time, there was no secularism, there was no real religion. Everything was Christian, loosely everything was Christendom. And so it's only really when, you know, when the West moved out and started to, in the age of exploration in particular, started realizing there are these very sophisticated belief systems elsewhere in the world. Yeah. And so that's when people started thinking, well, uh, well, gosh, there are other traditions here. There are other belief systems. Which one's right? And then, so religion emerges alongside secularism. Um, the idea that actually, if we're going to make sure we haven't got any wars over this stuff because people feel this, these beliefs pretty deeply, we should make sure we've got a nice neutral public square. And so we should start privatizing these, these beliefs. Um, but I think when, the, when you were coming of age, um, not so long ago, um, <laughs> the, the, the world was opening up to all sorts of different traditions and Britain was opening up to um, migrant communities who were believing different things and we were trying to navigate these different, different belief systems. And so it, it was a, there was a sort of sense of dislocation, uh, a yeah. sense of something that we were, were so familiar to us as starting, who is, is not obvious to everybody. I mean, the, one of the assumptions was that most religions have a god, right? Then I discover that Hinduism uh, can be said to have lots of god, mm. and of course, Buddhism doesn't have any at all. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, if there's been a a fascinating treasure hunt in the last 50 years among scholars uh, who study religion for uh, the meaning of religion. And it turns out, 50 years on, they still can't quite work out what the definition of a religion is. Really? Uh, because, as you say, there are all sorts of traditions that we'd want to say, that's definitely a religion. But they don't seem to be theistic. They don't really seem to have a sort of God as the object of their worship in quite the way that we would understand. So I think maybe a better way of thinking about it is, you know, what are the sort of features of, of religious belief? And there are lots and lots of ingredients that go into the mix. There's often a sort of sense of the sacred, something that needs yeah. to be set apart around which the society can sort of build itself. 
There's, um, there's a ritualistic element often. Yes. There's an emotional element. It's something that, that isn't just a, to do with the mind and just to do with cognition, but, but meaning. What, what satisfies, you know, the sense of the yearning for, for some, uh, some explanation for, for the way the world is, that you guys satirised so well in, in the meaning of life. <laughs> and, and that's something that, that it's not just religious people come to think of, but also philosophers. I mean, yeah. think, of, think of Aristotle. Aristotle says, you know, what sets us apart from the rest of the animal kingdom is that we're driven by a desire to understand. It's a very, very strange feature of, of human beings, that, that we should sort of... Yeah. You know, that they should spend their afternoon sitting down talking about <laughs> things like religion. Yeah. It's a very curious behaviour for the animal <laughs> kingdom. Um, and so religion, you can think of religions as a sort of the, the human response or expression or, 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 a, 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 or the human attempt to reach a certain set of answers mm. about questions of fundamental concern, yeah. questions of ultimate concern. What is ultimate, it going to be? Yeah, ultimate concern. Because he's the most important. And that might be a god, it might be Jesus, it might be Brian. <laughs> it, 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 or it might be Brian's gourd, or it might be Brian's sandal. You know, there's a focal point for the sacred around which a group can organise themselves and start making sense yeah. of the world. But your idea or clar that clarity is important to mm -hmm. defining the members and all that kind of thing, that isn't true of some of the Eastern religions because that's more about practice than... than uh, theology. Yes, isn't it? I mean, there's an enormous sort of mix of, of practice and theology, and in fact, very profound philosophy. And when we talk about theology and we talk about philosophy, we sometimes forget that there's actually no difference between the two before, certainly in the West, before around about, what, 1600. Both were ways of trying to answer the fundamental questions. And yeah. so in Hinduism and the Eastern traditions, you have these incredibly sophisticated philosophical treaties. Um, from millennia before that, that talk, um, uh, that, that try to understand how, what, what human beings are and what the nature of ultimate reality is. The case of Brahma, for example, or the ground of being. The genius of most of the great religions is that they recognize that the sort of deep philosophical questions don't, don't sort of disseminate very well to those who are not thinking about philosophy. And so you need, you need propositions, you need clarity, and also you need rituals, and you need where, and you... you so all... rituals, we're talking about, are we talking about spiritual practices? Or could be spiritual practices, they could be private spiritual practices of private devotions and so on, or they could simply be public um, uh, practices, just sort of, you know, crossing yourself before going to church. a meal, just, just turning up mm. uh, and just doing it without, without thinking very much. And that's, that's an important feature of religion, particularly in our, this day and age, when we're so disembodied staring at our screens the whole time and uh, we can't see, you know, we, 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 there's a real, there's, there's, a, there's a, a great sort of difficulty in um, trying to sort of, well, we tend to detach ourselves. Technology detaches us, mm -hmm. dislocates us from our embodied practices, as it were. And so religion has a, is, is a good anchor for that. Um, ah. it's, it's potent, and that's something that just mere beliefs and propositions and creedal statements don't, don't really deliver. James, that's great. I want to come back to you later, because I want to, there's something you've been saying to me when we were talking earlier that absolutely fascinated me, but I want to come back to that, and uh, see you then. Great. <laughs> There's uh, something rather important that we haven't uh, really chatted about yet, and that's next. Could you uh, possibly buzz off? <laughs> Thank you very much. This is Professor Julius Lipner, who's going to tell us all about Hinduism. So, in Hinduism, you have a number of gods. Can you explain that to me? Yes, I spent... Most of my career, John, <laughs> I'm trying to disprove that. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yes. Oh, in the excellent. sense, well, you are right and you are wrong at yeah. the same time, which is, uh, I'll take both. which is an achievement. Yes, yeah. we all do that. There are a number of gods in the sense that the one supreme being, yeah. if I can coin a word, purifies, manifests in different forms. Oh. So, so each god is an aspect. Of, of the one, one supreme being, uh -uh. yes. And the one supreme being in a more non-descriptive sense is called Brahman, Brahman. With Brahman is a, comes from the Sanskrit word meaning 
or verb meaning to be great, the great one. Great one. Connected with the word Brahmin? Connected with the word Brahmin. Yeah. Exactly. The Brahmin is the English form of Brahmana. Oh, actually. The Brahmanas who actually were the priestly caste for Brahman. Yes. Yeah. So a non-descriptive term, as it were, is Brahman, B-R-A-H-M-A-N. But Brahman was then given personal names by different factions or groups of Hindus. Oh, I see. And you have three major groups. Yeah. Those who regard the personal name, the name above all names, as Vishnu. Vishnu. So Brahman is Vishnu. And the followers of Vishnu are Vaishnavas. Those who regard Brahman under a different heading and different perspective as Shiva. Shiva. And the followers of Shiva are Shaivas. Uh -huh. And then, fairly uniquely among world religions, those who regard the Supreme Being in feminine terms, Shakti. So Shakti means power. So the goddess. Now, when you're talking about um, Buddhism, there's a great emphasis on meditation and spiritual exercises to try to purify your spirit, your, yes. your, your essence. Yes. What do you have in, in Hinduism as the equivalent? Similarly, I mean, not everyone is good at meditation because mm. you have to be still. Yes. You have to contemplate, but... Switch your phone off. Switch the phone off, the mobile off. is very hard for Hindus <laughs> to do, I can assure you. And, but the thing there is that it is an exercise in visualization. Uh, Hindus are trained to visualize. Uh, visualize the deity, visualize certain aspects of the life of the deity so that they can plunge into that life oh, and be part of it. Generally, Hindu worship is not particularly communal, as you would find in Christianity. That's what I'm interested yeah, in. It's it quite, seems much more individual. It is much more individualistic. But not, not to say that there is no communal worship, no. but a great deal depends on the individual yeah. being prepared. And so during the Arati service, which is at a fixed time, uh, they will turn up uh, to the temple. And then there's a service where in the Holy of Holies, not in view, there's a screen. And that during the Arati, um, there may be some hymns, uh, there are some priestly rituals, and then the bell is rung, a handbell. Uh -huh. And as the bell is being rung, the deity, the screen may, may open or a, a makeshift screen, uh -huh. and you get a viewing, a darshan of that deity. And that is a sacred moment, a very special moment. But that can be a communal moment. Well, you are with other people yeah. there. But it's individual but in you its experience. Are, you yes, are, it is yeah, individual yeah. in its experience because you are making contact with, through this darshan, this viewing with the deity. The deity views you, you view the deity. You know you're among a community. Yeah. But it doesn't have that same communal dimension necessarily as you find in Christianity. Yes. I like the more individual approach because I think the trouble with the Christian approach is you sort of go and look a bit po-faced for a couple of hours and then go off and screw people financially for the rest of the week. <laughs> I will make no comment on that, John. But to come back to your original question about the... Uh, different forms of yeah. Vishnu, Shiva, or the goddess. So you have these three individual preferred names uh -huh. of the deity, but then Vishnu manifests in many forms. And there, what you can call this a monotheism, but a polymorphic monotheism. The one God manifests in numerous forms. Is it a tiny bit like the Christian trinity? where you sort of somehow have three separate elements, but actually they're all one. Three in one and one in three. Yeah. Except that you can have 50 in one and one in 50. Yeah, which is more interesting. <laughs> yeah, but they would, so Shiva would be brought in for a Vish, yeah. Vaishnava or Vishnu ceremony, yeah. but he'd be subservient <laughs> to Vishnu. But if I were to describe Hinduism in two words, I would say adaption 
and absorption. Hindus are very good at adapting uh -huh. and they're very good at absorbing ideas into their own system from other traditions. Oh. And by adapting, Hinduism can continue to be relevant in contemporary times. So the concept of avatar or the taking on of a different form of one individual or one deity oh. is such that for many Hindus, Jesus is an avatar or Vishnu. Oh. So he's been brought in to the Hindu fold, absorbed, adapted, and they've got traditional avatars or Vishnu, but Jesus has been added by many Hindus and said, he's an avatar for the Christians. He came down for the Christians and yeah. he's, God is helping the Christians through Jesus. I love this because it's so inclusive. That's it. It's a very inclusive Thank process. you so much. You must want to Fascinating. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So we had James Orr in that section talking about Christianity, and then we had yeah. Julius Lipner talking about Hinduism. So you've got a sort of monotheistic religion and a polytheistic religion. Yeah. I like the idea of lots of gods. I mean, it's not something that I've ever sort of subscribed to, but I like the whole sort of, like ancient Rome and ancient Greece and the, the a multiplicity of gods. A god yeah. for everything, for everything that you need. That's yeah, nice because idea. it's more believable in a way, because God is so busy. If there would be the 15 of them, they could divide up the powers. It would make more sense, wouldn't it? I like watching that Juli Julius, Julius guy. Lippner, yeah, yeah. He because, nice. because he's, he was like a Czech Jew who landed in India. And so he was raised... Is that right? Yes, in India. And then, so he's basically, he strikes, he's, strikes you as Indian, but he's... But he's like a cultural hybrid. Yeah, okay. he's like, it could have been me. This is what I could have been if my family had ended up I mean, over there. He's a very smart guy. Yes, yeah, I don't know. If, I don't know. If, and yeah. I think he went to Oxford. Yeah, I mean, he's, ended a, up in, he's a professor. Yeah. In Oxford. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. He's a deep thinker. You have, like, I think with a lot of these theologically minded people, yeah. they have to be very deep thinkers, don't they? To sort of, because it's such a vast topic. Well, they have to be a deep thinker because if they act all goofy, no one's going to listen to them. Well, is there's that, that. Yeah. Is that? Do you believe in God? I believe in a certain type of God. Okay, what I type do, of God? I believe in it's the, a God of uh, who punishes, as a way of teaching his teaching something. Like an Old Testament God. Yes. Like it, yeah. You yes. like the fire and brimstone. Kind no, of stuff. I'm on a more personal way. I, I, I tell you what I believe, which is genius. I believe God doesn't have time to reward people's good behavior. Right. He only has time to reward bad behavior, not to, to punish bad to behavior. To punish bad behavior. So, so why do bad people get away with so much? Then? They, they don't get away. Like, like. Jordan Peterson says they don't get away don't with they? it. No, no, bad people get punished in the end, and like, and 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 what happens is is that we, when we the, the biggest mistake we make is by taking something for granted. Yes. And when we take things for granted, we get punished by not being quad, qual, quality, by not doing a good job. Like me today, I didn't really prepare for this. I can tell. Okay. Yeah. So God is punishing me by making me seem like incompetent in this discussion. And that's you, you're doing that yourself? Yes. That's not God. No, <laughs> he, could, he could intercede. He could say, you know, we like Lewis, so we're gonna make him seem like he's really super funny and intelligent, but he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. No. What is it, what have you, you must ask yourself what it is you have done to incur his wrath. No, I know what I've done. Yeah. I have not prepared, nor taken this as seriously as I should, and now I'm like panicking. I really enjoyed making the show wide variety of different types of people and the team were all great and the extras were all great yeah and you got to talk to all of these people you you, you developed quite a warm relationship with the nuns particularly uh you got a few telephone numbers yeah from <laughs> um and then i, I kissed a nun um you yeah did. well i you, as you know i'm 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 in the film business myself. I've well, been on many, many... You should explain that to people, that you're not really in the film business. You, you, you are an extra. Shh, shh. I'm a supporting artist. Supporting artist. I'm but sorry, I have had it. relatively large roles in some of these well, films. Well, you had a line in Wonder Woman, didn't you? I had a line what, in Wonder Woman. What was Woman. the line? Uh, we have to see the president, something like you that. You do that very well. I, did I was very, convinced. Did it, but people noticed it. Whatever yeah. it is, don't belittle yeah. me, oh, Andrew. I'm being sincere. These people don't know. No, I'm being sincere. You're interpreting me okay. and belittling you. I'm not. So I have been I'm on, impressed. I'm, I'm not listening to you. you. You need to be a comedian. You need to be a performer. Something inside you, you know, is screaming out for attention. No. Can I say one thing? You can say whatever you, know, you like. Yeah. What actual John, please. Less is more. 
Yes, whereas your yeah. instinct is to overplay. Yes, because, yeah. I, because I'm an amateur and a failure. You're a drama queen. Yeah. But <laughs> everything's got to be a drama with you. The Dinosaur Hour, with me, John Cleese, on GB News. Now, a rather odd question for our resident pollster, Frank Luntz. Frankie, how do you quantify religion? Excellent question, John, but it's complicated. The fact is, the fastest growing religions are no religions at all. Atheists, agnostics, are growing at five and six percent, faster than Christianity, Islam, Hindu. But the real question is, how do you measure religion? And what we have found, the more dedicated you are, the more likely you are to identify with a religion. So those people who attend church maybe once a year, they don't really count. It's the people who identify religion as being essential in their lives. And in that case, Christianity and Islam are the fastest growing religions. Thank you, Frank. Around about the time that I discovered Aldous Huxley's essay, um, I began to get a little bit interested in Alan Watts and his writings about Eastern religion. And what immediately drew me was Buddhism. Um, because it's non-revelatory in the sort of Western sense. And it just seems so terribly sensible. So I thought it would be fun to ask some questions about Buddhism. Kate Crosby, hello. Hello. Thanks for doing this show. Thanks for having me. Uh, you teach Buddhism at Oxford. That's right. Now, Ouija here, do I pronounce your name right, Ouija? Yes. Ouija, the rest of your name is unpronounceable <laughs> to somebody like me. Yes. Thank you very much for coming. It seems to me that Buddhism does not have a god. Well, that's Whoa. partly true. Partly true. So there's no creator god. No God who can save us. Uh -huh. That's something we have to do ourselves with uh -huh. the teaching of the Buddha. But everywhere the Buddhism spreads, it adopts the gods of the area. So when it spread to, to the West, a lot of people were atheist. So no gods for Western Buddhism. But for example, in Sri Lanka, where Venerable Widji is from, there you have a whole range of gods that are useful for things that are part of ordinary life you know, like passing your exams or you need help with healing or something like that, you can go to a god. But they're all, like us, caught up in the round of rebirth, death and rebirth, samsara. Ouija, I want to ask, when you pray, to whom are you praying? Actually, we don't pray. You we don't pray? Yes, we respect uh, to the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. These three are called triple gems then we respect to them and we follow the teachings preached by the Buddha with a highest respect to the teacher. The Buddha is our teacher. He is not a god, actually. I'm very interested that Buddhism, unlike Islam or Christianity or uh, Judaism, these are religions of the book. There are many sacred writings, but they're not thought of in the same kind of way that uh, the religions of the book respect the book. Am I right? Uh, that's right. So there are. Uh, so after the Buddha died, they gathered up all the teachings they could remember that he had given. Some were teachings about how to behave. Uh, some were special rules for monks and nuns to follow. And so those were the two first collections. But they're more like a library. Uh -huh. So they have lots of books in them on different topics rather than a single book. So probably about the size of maybe 90, 90 books. Oh, really? So it's a library. I yeah. no idea so you can go so to many. one for ecclesiastical yeah. law, another for poetry that's about teachings, this kind of thing. Poetry. Some stories, lots of stories about the Buddha being in a particular place and teaching a particular teaching for a particular person. When were these written down, roughly? So they were orally remembered from the time of the Buddha's death, so about three months after the Buddha died. Which is what year? Oh, this is in the 6th century before the Common Era, so about two and a half thousand years uh, ago. Right. The Buddha dies, and three months after, they have a big gathering, and people 
record what it was they remembered him saying and which rules they remember him setting down. And then people become specialists in memorising those bits of text. Ah. And it passes down over the generations. And we think that they first started writing down about the first century before the Common Era, when they were worried... <laughs> <laughs> this is my water. There when you they are. were you worried can have that water, my darling. ...about um, losing the teachings, the Dharma, the teachings, because of famine and warfare. Yeah. So at that point thought it, write it down. You see, it seems to me that Christianity is often sort of saying about what we should be doing, but Buddhism has a way of saying how we can get there. I mean, when Christ said, love thine enemy, the answer is, how? <laughs> you know what I mean? That's it's a right, bit like so saying, move backwards in time. You want to say, well, yeah, sure, but how do I do that? Whereas with the Buddha, Buddhism is working on the inner part much more than Christianity normally does, except in the mystic traditions. And that, that seems to me to have a better chance of improving everyone's, first of all, happiness, but also their behaviour to others. There are some very good meditations, for example, to deal with... Um, hatred or anger, there's a meditation to develop loving-kindness towards yourself first and then extend it to others. Yes. To get rid of jealousy, there's a meditation on developing joy at other people's success and well-being. And yes. that's really useful. So that love your neighbour, it's got techniques for actually developing those. That's what excites me, yes. Because yes, I saw a programme many years ago about Buddhism. A friend of mine, Ron Eyre, made it for the BBC. It's called The Long Search. And he was saying to a Buddhist monk, uh, it sounds a bit selfish working all the time on yourself. Mm -hmm. And the Buddhist monk said, yes, if it stopped there, that you can't love other people until you can love yourself. That was very powerful for me. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yes, actually. We have two main concepts in Buddhism, uh, karuna and metta, loving kindness and compassion. These two help us uh, to serve the society. Uh, these two are limitless thoughts which uh, arises in our mind. Uh, therefore, if we can develop compassion and loving kindness towards all the beings in these worlds, uh, not only to human beings, yeah. Towards all the beings, including animals, including creatures and other yeah, uh, yeah. sentient beings. Cats. Hear yes, that, cats Charlie? also, actually. Charlie's practicing loving kindness. Oh, right look now. at him. He's the adorable. <laughs> you know, I was once lucky enough to interview the Dalai Lama, um, a person on a different level. Uh, but I did ask him, I said, when I notice Buddhists, they smile and laugh a lot. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, I think when people laugh, they can have new ideas. That's quite important in Buddhist texts as well. So Is the it? early Buddhist texts. So the Buddha would sometimes get somebody to see something by making a joke out of it. Uh -huh. So it was basically undermining um, people's fixed views by showing them a funny side. You see, what Syria. appeals to me about Buddhism, to go back to what we were talking about earlier, is the fact that people are working on themselves and having spiritual exercises, most of them meditational, uh, which enable them to process negative feelings and turn them more into positive feelings. And there's a lot of people, younger people now, who are saying, always trust your feelings. That doesn't seem to me very good advice. <laughs> But uh, the Buddhism highlights that understanding the mind is yes. very important, actually. After identifying the inner feelings, one can control those inner feelings. Uh, for example, anger. Uh, when we get angry, actually, we feel uh, different kinds of thoughts. If we release those thoughts into the society, actually, yeah. what will happen? Yes, yes, that's yes. right. Yes, before releasing those kinds of thoughts, actually, one should have to control those thoughts. The way for that is meditation. Yeah. Actually, then meditation. But in meditation, you're examining your feelings. Yes. Rather than accepting them uncritically, right? Yeah. 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 I can't think of any more questions, Kate. Have you got any suggestions? 
uh, why don't we stop talking and have a little bit of meditation to finish off? Sure. Okay. Okay. So we've talked about loving kindness and developing that. If we all just sit here, nice and comfortable, feet on the floor, nice and well supported, right hand on left, and still, and just close your eyes or leave them slightly open, and then begin by trying to generate a warm feeling in the center of your body, thinking, may I be well and happy. May I be well and happy. And after we've generated that feeling in the center of our body, we're gonna radiate that out to everyone in the room, the cats, the people, the crew, everyone here, everyone in the castle, and out, out into the universe. So let's sit here, generate the feeling, may I be well and happy. May all beings be well and happy. And then come back to the room, come back to yourself and retain that feeling of warmth and kindness at the center of your body. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So now I'm going to try and wrap things up by going back to Professor, I mean, Associate Professor James Law. Tell me where Christianity is now. Well, Christianity worldwide is in a pretty rude state of health. Certainly in South America, it's seen enormous growth in, in recent decades, and in Africa in particular, it's seen enormous biological growth. Mm. Even in China, where it's been persecuted pretty systematically for the last 50 China? years. China, yeah, despite, despite the absence of any kind of missionary activity, it does All seem right. to be spreading very, very quickly to, to the alarm of the Communist Party. In fact, I think there are more, even the Communist Party in China accepts that there are more Christians than there are members of the Communist Party. No. Uh, so that's a very interesting, interesting phenomenon. But you're absolutely, I mean, in the sort of the northwestern Eurasian rim of Euro Eurasia, Christianity does seem to be struggling a little bit, and religious adherence numbers are down. Certainly, and, and secularism is on the rise, and atheism seems to be on the rise. But Christianity, like religion, um, tends to bury its undertakers. Uh, that is to say, it, it, it's got an extraordinary ability, as religion has more generally, to adapt. Uh, it's, got, it's very, very good at, at, effectively, very good at surviving. And even when we think of the West being dominated by the sort of great high priests of the new atheism or whatever, we're actually still thinking in a very Christian way about the God that we are rejecting. Because that's the rejecting. fundamental structure of our thinking, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's People right. brought up in the middle of it. Exactly. It's like the old joke of, you know, one goldfish asking the other, how's the water? And the other goldfish saying, what's water? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're just, we're so familiar with it that, that we can't even recognise it. We don't even realise that we're being influenced. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. if you think of the great atheists of the last 150 years, someone like a Nietzsche or someone like um, uh, uh, the character in uh, uh, Ivan Karamazov in Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov, they're driven by the kind of moral energy, that sense that, that, that the world is structured in, in, in a morally ordered way yeah. that would have been completely unthinkable to a Roman or, or to a Greek. Yeah. Um, think also of doctorate, the sort of the idea about equality, human equality, the human family, human rights. Those are, or humanism itself, yeah. those are basic, those are, that, that whole sort of structure is something that comes very much from Judaism and, and from Christianity, the idea that we are all, as it were. Certain deep, deep assumptions. Yeah, that's yeah. right, that's right. I, I was thinking, and I only really realised this relatively recently, that Christianity was a kind of complete reversal of the morality of the classical era, mm -hmm. and that that 
reversal is still with us, yeah. thank God. Yeah. yeah. Yes, it's, it's difficult for us to, as it were, imagine just what a horror show in moral terms uh, the world of Greece and Rome really was. <laughs> it's, it's easy to sort of glamorize it in films and so on. But it was a horrific world to be in if you were not a, effectively, a male Roman citizen. Yeah. Um, and the brutality was uh, unlike anything that we could really contemplate. I mean, the morality was almost completely absent, wasn't it? Any sense of sympathy or kindness towards the disadvantaged. Yes, absolutely. And there was no real sense that human beings are human beings, in the sense that human yeah. beings are all part of a single family, as it were, yeah. where everyone from prince to pauper has an equal dignity. This is a very strange idea, but it takes root with Christianity. And it's still with us even as Christianity yeah. enters its twilight phase in the West. So it's a, it's a bit, it's almost as if modernity has a sort of phantom limb syndrome. Uh. You know, it's sort of scratching its moral itch uh, on a limb that doesn't really, on a Christian limb that doesn't really exist yeah. anymore. Yeah. But it's still got the reflexes. It's a little bit like what I felt growing up in Western Supermare, that there was something Protestant about it, but nobody was interested in religion. Yes, you know, there were nice qualities yeah. like honesty, and mm. and uh, there was actually there was a real sympathy for people and a real simple kindness there among these mm -hmm. people. But it was Christian, but there was no theology. That's right. It's a sort of Christian residue, and there's sort of nothing more Christian in a way than rejecting Christianity, than asserting your, your individual freedom to make up your own mind. That's a very sort of Protestant impulse. Mm. But um, yes, I think that, that, that's absolutely right. And certainly the, the care and sort of attention that we have today on the marginalized, on the dispossessed, uh, on the, the valorizing of, of the victim uh -huh. uh, would have been unthinkable. Uh, in a, any moral universe bef before the, the Christian revolution in the first century. Thanks. Having listened to everyone, I find I come back to Aldous Huxley. Religion can be either an experience of the divine, um, Alcoholics Anonymous might say of a higher power, uh, a sense that there's something bigger and more important than we are, or it's about following rules so that you don't go to hell where little pink devils will poke you with red hot pitchforks for all eternity. Now, when the devil took Jesus up to the mountain top and offered him power and, and, and dominion over everything, Jesus said he had more interesting things to do. Actually, I don't think it was the devil. I think it was Jesus's ego. And I think the Beatitudes are all about trying to reduce the power of our egos. Unfortunately, our egos are very clever. So if we start feeling extra humble one morning and start thinking, oh, I'm proud of my humility, then the whole thing collapses again. So I believe that any religion that encourages us to look inside and to learn how to control our egos is a real religion. Music.
Goodbye. Next time on the Dinosaur Hour. And then when it wasn't sugar, it became tobacco. And I smoked. And then in my 20s, it became cocaine. It became that. I just... And I couldn't sit still without going... <sighs> it's a true story. The first week, my wife, were, we were in uh, Arizona. She got stung by a scorpion. <gasps> I said, but luckily, she's Mexican. The scorpion what? was... What do you mean the, by that? The scorpion was throwing up for hours. <laughs> <laughs> a scorpion. <laughs> <laughs> You interview Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, we're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Who is it? We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour, with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. So join me, Nana Aquir, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Is it, it, you... <laughs> it's my new teeth. your new teeth? I don't... I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
Good evening, you're with GB News. The top story this hour, the Home Office says it does have robust plans in place for migrant flights to Rwanda following reports that some airlines are refusing to take part in the government's illegal migration policy. It comes after the Deputy Prime Minister said Rishi Sunak was right to warn that illegal migration could overwhelm European states. Oliver Dowden insisted the government's Rwanda plan will work and is an essential step towards getting a grip on the problem. We will make sure that we have the right piece of legislation. It's not about keeping one part of the party happy or another part of the happy. I look, I'm, I'm confident that uh, the Prime Minister has looked at this very carefully and has got the best possible measures. But if there are ways of improving it further, just as with any piece of legislation, we'll work with backbench members of parliament, including Conservatives. If we can make it even better, of course we'll do that. Oliver Dowden. Now, Baroness Michelle Moan has admitted she failed to reveal her links to a company that supplied PPE gowns to the NHS during the COVID-19 pandemic. MedPro is the company currently being investigated by the National Crime Agency, while the Department of Health is taking action over a breach of contract. She told the BBC that she made an error by not revealing her links to the company, which led to her husband's trust receiving around £60 million pounds of taxpayers' money. But she insisted that lying to the media wasn't a crime. International news and there's been growing pressure